our sponsor for this event, the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Thanks, too, to all of you uh, tuning in around the globe. We are thrilled that you are here. Uh, Roger Rosenblatt, whose prolific light work, ugh, Roger Rosenblatt, whose prolific work has been published in 14 languages, is the author of five New York Times notable books of the year and three Times bestsellers, including the memoirs Kayak Morning, The Boy Detective, and Making Toast, originally an essay in The New Yorker. The Story I Am, a collection on writing and life, was published in April of 2020, and Cold Moon on life, love, and responsibility was published in October 2020. He has written seven off-Broadway plays, notably the one-person Free Speech in America that he performed in the American Place Theater, named one of the New York Times' 10 best plays of 1991. In 2019, the Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor produced Lives in the Basement, Does Nothing, his one-person musical about the writing life for which he played jazz piano. The distinguished professor of English and writing at Stony Brook, Rosen, uh, Stony Brook Rosenblatt formerly held the Briggs Copeland appointment in creative writing at Harvard, where he earned his PhD. Among his honors are two George Polk Awards, the Peabody and the Emmy for his essays in Time Magazine and on PBS. A Fulbright to Ireland, where he played on the Irish international basketball team, seven honorary doctorates, the Kenyon Review Award for Lifetime Literary Achievement, and the President's Medal from the Chautauqua Institution for his body of work. It is my distinct pleasure to be in conversation with him today. Uh, if you could please give a warm welcome to the 1965 Fulbright U.S. Student and Scholar to Ireland, Roger Rosenblatt. Roger, how are you doing? I'm fine, Daniel, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. Well, I first want to start with, um, you know, both of us were part of the U.S. Fulbright Student Program, which for me was this period of intense intellectual and personal growth. Uh, both on the page and off. I felt like I was always being stretched outside of my comfort zones. Could you talk a little bit about your Fulbright experience in Ireland and what that was like for you? I was just thinking of me being stretched out of my comfort zone. Uh, when I played on the Irish international basketball team, we were all Americans uh, there because that is not the sport of Ireland or of Europe, although it's, you know, it's, although it's gaining. In fact, European basketball is pretty good, but not then. It wasn't then. We played on a slate court. And I, uh, I was just thinking about being stretched out of shape when we played the Garda, which is the, which is the local police department. And you go up for a shot and the, 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 um, uh, the local cops would then hit you in the side of the neck. You'd fall down uh, on the slate. They'd get, they'd reach their hand up and say, oh, let, let me help you up that. And the, uh, so I was stretched out of shape as you would, uh, <laughs> uh, not as uh, intelligently uh, or spiritually. But like you, the Fulbright was a wonderful, wonderful year. I'd never been to Europe before. My wife had never been uh, before. It was all an, an eye opener for everything, for meeting people and the Irish are the most generous and welcoming people. For learning a new language, I learned a little Irish, um, Irish Gaelic, um, for making friends and uh, for being somewhere else. The, the wisdom of Bill Fulbright to know how important it was to be somewhere else. And then you start to learn what it is to be in someone else's shoes. Yeah. You know, during my time as a Fulbrighter in Mexico City, I was writing there during a time of great political and social change, as I imagine Ireland was going through at that time. It was. Um, yeah. And it proved to be, I mean, for me, it was, it was like invaluable to the work, the novel that I was working on, which was about um, the contemporary drug war in Mexico. But then also it was, it was really integral to the way in which I conceived of myself or thought of myself as, as, a, as not only a writer, but like an American writer. Um, <laughs> That's an interesting observation. When when I was when I was there, the um, IRA blew up Nelson Pillar. Nelson Pillar was this monumental uh, statue or pillar uh, in the middle of Dublin, and um, the IRA blew it up. Nobody was hurt. It was a really a surgical um, sabotage. Uh, and I went down there and. Uh, uh, that morning and so I actually wrote a poem about it which they published in the Irish Times but the uh, and I remember uh, I remember there was a woman there who took a look at the rubble I mean we were talking about something that had been up there a hundred years and, and established England's foothold in Ireland which of course the Irish were not going to tolerate and thus they blew it up and so it was gone it was there and then it was gone and the woman said to her friend ah sure it was always getting in my way anyway <laughs> Yeah. Do, do you feel like, I mean, 
that you perhaps became a different kind of writer or a better writer because of the Fulbright? Not then. Um, I was I was kind of mired in academia. Uh, I had written a little. I always wanted to write as a child, but. Uh, life sometimes finds you taking or creating diversions which may in the long run be valuable to you but it's all mysterious at the time I wasn't really writing at all except I had gone to do my dissertation my PhD dissertation on John Millington Singh and Singh isn't really a writer that makes himself available to much uh, cr a critical scrutiny he's just good he's just a natural but on looking around poking around the bookstores, I found the journal and letters of Stephen McKenna. Stephen McKenna was a journalist in Dublin at the time of Singh, very close friend of Singh and of Joyce and of Yates. And uh, it was so interesting. And he was such an interesting guy that I did my, wound up doing my thesis on him. A fellow named E.R. Dodds, who was the Regis Professor of Poetry at Oxford, had done this book. Um, it shows you how a different world it was though. I mean, it was so easy to move around and people just accepted you. I sent a note uh, to E.R. Dodds at Oxford. I'd never met him before. Um, uh, obviously, I just came in out of the blue. He sent a note back saying, come on over. Um, I went over to his house in Oxford. He gave me a gin, the side of the Ritz, and all of, all of the McKenna papers in his possession on the, on the deal that I would give them to the Irish uh, library when I finished, which, of course, I did. But I had all this original material. It was, it was you know, it was just... It was dumb luck, but I was very, very grateful. He was a terrific man. Wrote wonderful books himself on Greek mythology. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, I sometimes joke. I mean, this is sort of like an anecdote that sort of segues to this question I have. I mean, I joke that you're kind of like a tr like the true life, most interesting man in the world. You know, I mean, you had such a remarkable story career from your early beginnings. I love those commercials. I, 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 They're the greatest. <laughs> But you, you kind of have, I mean, you, you've done, uh, you worked at the New Republic. I mean, you were uh, an essayist for PBS NewsHour, you know. Time I, yeah, I, you know, Daniel, you, you, honestly, I made all that stuff up. I didn't know it. I, didn't, I never did any of that stuff. I, 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 I just, you know, I just hung around the house most of the time. And, and yeah. Then I, then I got called by you. Yes, I was very, <laughs> I was very lucky. And, uh, and, and, it, and it really was uh, luck. Um, the job on the New Republic, came from Marty Peretz, Martin Peretz, who bought the New Republic. And he and I were on the faculty at Harvard together. And uh, I was working at the National Endowment for the Humanities at the time. Now there was a job. If you had known me then, you would have found me extremely interesting because I gave away $120 million a year. And wow. so everybody found me interesting and everybody found me very funny. Um, and then suddenly when I left the job, those qualities left me. But yeah. while I was uh, when, I, when I was walking on the street and saw Marty, Marty said, uh, I just bought the New Republic. And I was, <laughs> that wasn't my world. So I just assumed he bought a copy of the New Republic. In any case, he bought the magazine and he wanted me to be the literary editor. And from that point on, uh, life uh, changed. It really changed on a dime, uh, slowly in the right direction, not immediately, but slowly in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, something I've noticed in your work, I've sort of did a deep dive, you know, I was reading the work, you know, things that you were doing at the, New, at the New Republic, but also Time and, you know, later at, at PBS NewsHour and even in your book, Cold Moon. Um, one of my favorite things that you've done is like this letter to 2086 um, that you, that it's put in a time capsule at the base of the uh, Statue of Liberty. But I've noticed this through line throughout your career that you have a real knack for writing into the unknown. Um, <laughs> I was I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, like, that's a, that's a very interesting observation. I'd never thought of it, but um, I guess you're right. I, uh, I like going on the uh, edge um, when I do readings or when I give speeches, I don't write them out. Um, sometimes I don't have any notes. Uh, I like the feeling of, I like the tightrope walk. And I figured that, and I think most people do, I figure something will come to me. Something will come to me. Richard Wilbur has, has a wonderful poem like that, uh, like that um, saying that a general holding out his hands would receive the baton, something will come to you. And so writing into the unknown, which is your phrase and far better than anything I could come up with is probably really what I do. I'm interested in the unknown. It's the um, only place to be really. And so uh, Cold Moon, which I did, is practically all about the unknown, about taking the known and then using it as a, a springboard to the things you don't know. Yeah. I mean, do you feel like, 
perhaps your approach to writing or the page has changed throughout your career? Do you feel like, do you have a, a certain practice or a certain sort of frame of mind or is it that writing to the unknown that is always the base or how is it, how has your writing changed throughout the well, one, one, one way it, it, it changed was uh, I was writing essays for the New Republic and then I was a columnist on the Washington Post um, briefly uh, for a couple of years. And then Time Magazine um, called, can I tell you that story by the way? Do we have, yeah. do we have remember that? So does that <laughs> I'll give you an idea of how bright I am. Anyway, we were broke and we were living in Vermont. All right, you, I mean, you may not have done this yet, but all writers have to live in Vermont, it's the law. So you'll be getting a letter from the stayed at some point saying, you know, you have to live here. And yeah. we all do the same thing. We go up to Vermont to try to write the book that we were meant to write. We don't do a damn thing. I wind up talking to woodchucks and beavers for most of the year. <laughs> and then we got a phone call from Time Magazine and uh, Jenny, my wife got it, answered it. And um, I said, she said, it's Time Magazine holding up her hand on the, on the receiver. Uh, and I said, no, 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 we can't afford a subscription. She said, no, no, I think it's about something else. And so I got on and it was the editor, Ray Cave, and he, he was a wonderful man, was a lifetime friend, just died last year, actually. Um, and Ray wanted me to come to New York to discuss the job, which I was so happy, to, the idea of actually getting a job. Uh, and he wanted me to write the Time essay. So I was happy to do that or happy to have that as a prospect. But I didn't want him to think that I was a rube, that I wasn't sophisticated enough. So when I drove down to New York to see him, I talk, he talked about the salary and he talked about the assignment and uh, everything was fine to me. Frankly, any salary, 50 bucks, that would have been fine to me. But I wanted to show him that I had some gumption and I said, you know, oh, my voice was cracking because I was about to tell a lie. I said, well, I'm used to four weeks vacation. Well, this was both true and not true uh, they, um, at the Washington Post where I worked before I got three weeks vacation, but I worked in a university before that where you get three months vacation. So I figured the whole thing averaged out. <laughs> well, I said, <laughs> I'm used to four weeks vacation. Now you got a picture Ray Cave. He was Captain Ahab without the sense of humor. <laughs> sitting across the desk from me, looking at me severely and knowing that I was a fraud. And he uh, said, finally, he waited a second. He finally said, well, Roger, we ordinarily start with five weeks, but in your case, we'll make an exception. <laughs> it just goes from there. <laughs> it was a wonderful job. I loved being at time most of the time uh, and uh, uh, had, have friends, uh, still friends uh, from uh, that, that time of life. And I learned to write. 800 words or think in terms of 800 to 1,000 words because that was my page, the essay page. That was an advantage because as Richard Wilbur says, the strength of the genie comes from being in a bottle. The idea of being contained made you choose your language very carefully and also make the point very carefully while at the same time having the, um, the relaxation of an essay. So the form was very good, but at least it was good for me. Uh, and I did long reporting stories too when I got tired of what they called thumb sucking, which was just sitting around thinking. So I went out and, and saw the saw something of the world, something of the violent world, actually. Um, was that children? Children, was that children of war? It was. That was mm -hmm. the big one um, where I had seen a, a child, a kid, a uh, boy, um, one of, in in during one of the interminable Iran Iraqi wars standing in the rubble and he was crying, but he wasn't injured, you could see that. And I thought to myself, he was sort of wailing for the whole condition of wars. Wars are going on right now, 40 wars at a time in, in the world. We can't resist it. The animal can't resist knocking each other off. So um, I said to myself, children of war, I sort of muttered my, to myself, children of war, what is it like to grow up in these countries and, uh, and try to live a life? Went to Ray Cave, Ray Cave said, fine, that would not happen now. Nobody, there was the money in journalism, nobody would do it, but then it was a rich time. And I went around the world to war zones, half a dozen war zones, talking to children. And then I did this long story in time, which became a book. And it was a satisfying book on uh, many levels. I don't mean my writing, I just mean certain consequences, such as one young man who I knew at the age of eight and who had escaped Paul Potts 
uh, uh, murderers. Mm. Um, when I wrote the story, a uh, family in Lowell, Massachusetts read the story and uh, adopted him as a foster child and gave him a whole life in America. Those are the wow. rare things, rare things in journalism when something good like that happens. But I was very, I was very lucky. But I'm giving you a long-winded answer and forgive that. But um, I had never still done the writing that I wanted to do. That is purely imaginative writing. And uh, when I turned 60, this is now a long time ago, when I had turned, turned 60, I was at a writing conference with um, Margaret Atwood and uh, E.L. Doctorow, Billy Collins and others. And I, was, I went to every reading and they went to mine too, I, um, which was kind of them, but I went to every reading. And I said to myself, these people have been doing what they wanted to do their whole lives. And I have not. So at that point, I turned on a dime. I quit my job at Time. I quit my job at the News Hour. I also quit money, by the way. So I noticed that. But um, I started to write the kinds of things I wanted to write. And, and for the last 20 years, I've been doing that. Yeah. Aren't you well, glad you asked? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I do have like a, I mean, this segues to this crap question I have, which is like, you know, there's such an immediate rapport in your work between the writer and the reader. Um, as a reader, I sense you're like right behind the page. You know, nice. it's a real magic trick. Um, I mean, do you sense the reader as you're, as you're writing, as you're drafting? Yes, sir, I do. Um, I hear my voice when I write. Uh, and uh, it's as if I'm in a compact, a, an agreement with the reader. Uh, the reader has taken her time or his time to be with me. I'm going to try to make that experience worthwhile. So I do think about the reader. Yeah. I want to segue to your newest book, um, Cold Moon, on life, love, and responsibility. I have it here. I'm not sure if that's backwards in the uh, screen. Yeah, <laughs> looks good. It is an incredible meditation on life, the power of love, and the importance of responsibility for each other. Um, could you read to us a little bit of Cold Moon? With pleasure. Um, the, I must tell you, I, have, I had an eye trouble when I had a little work done just the day before yesterday. So uh, if I have more difficulty than I ought to have, I apologize at the beginning, but I'll do my best. This is how Cold Moon begins. Cold Moon's a meditation. And the Cold Moon, uh, for readers who don't know, or, or for the audience who doesn't know, is the last moon of the year, the last full moon of the year that augurs the winter solstice. And I was staying at a uh, place in New Jersey on the, on the ocean. And looking out at this cold moon uh, and thinking that here I am in the winter solstice of my life. What have I learned? What is there anything valuable that I might share with the reader? And it you know, came naturally. I, uh, I value life, love, and responsibility. So I'll read you the beginning of the book, and then I'll read you a, page, a couple of sections within the book, and then I'll read you the end, and that will give you the sense of the book. But the book really is just. Uh, it just goes uh, on things that demonstrate life and love and responsibility. Wipe the tears from your face and see the boulevard of light the moon has cast on the black water. See the boulevard as a staircase laid flat for a moment before it takes shape and rises. Like the one in the movie Stairway to Heaven, a sort of celestial escalator made of white marble steps moving forever skyward. The story is about a courtroom trial in heaven a battle for a man's soul, whether he should die young as he was scheduled to do or be allowed to remain on earth and live out a long life. A woman's love for him wins the case. Love wins the case. Wipe the tears from your face and see the moonlight and rise. No need for a stair stairway. Hold on to your soul. One shot of courage and we're climbing. Sitting on a bench with, oh, by the way, I write in segments and I've done this for the last 10 books. Um, I, I play a little piano and I, and I think of it as m uh, movements of music. So each, th each section I, I think of or try to think of as uh, shifting the song, moving the song along as you do in jazz. Sitting on a bench with my 10 year old grandson, Sam, I watch his brother, six year old James balance himself while while standing barefoot on the top rail of a high white wooden fence. James does things like that, climbs something and finds a perch, disregarding any possible danger. Now, dressed in red shorts and a Washington Nationals blue t-shirt, he is gazing out to sea. 
his little body angled away from Sam and me. It's a wonder how James goes off on his own and takes in whatever he can, I remarked to Sam. Without turning to me and looking admiringly at his brother, Sam says matter-of-factly, he loves life. Midnight on December 20th, 2019, nearing the advent of the year of flawless hindsight. A bloodshot orange presents itself without notice on the northern horizon, just above the dark beach and the dark sea. This is the cold moon, also identified as the long night's moon, the last before the winter, winter solstice. My weathered mind flicks to my own winter solstice, the coming of my winter time of life. Through a three windowed wall, I watch and brood. The sea rolls out like an old dog into its own black coat. The cold moon, now saffron white, sketches a sporadically spotlit path, recalling the jungle runways I saw in Africa when I was a journalist writing about wars. Dim lights, like phosphorescent animals, murmur at the far end of the beach. The beach itself, a bench of, of rogue jurists versed in maritime law. A solitary turn hangs in the air on the word wait. An unseen magistrate asks, who is responsible for this wreck? How still is night? And with every passing year, a hardening of the arteries, the bones fray, the, skins, the skin puckers, the skills ebb. At this age, comrade, at this stage, what is to be done? Should we toss in the towel or gallop across the Anikov Bridge together in the opposite direction whence we came and like the czars make a palace of winter? I am a book in your lap. Better to know where to go than how to get there. I wander from thought to thought, having learned but three things from my long night's moon. I believe in life. I believe in love. I believe we are responsible for each other. And then Daniel, the book goes on uh, like that. I talk about J.B. Priestley's play in Inspector Calls, where a young woman kills herself and the family, nobody laid a finger on her, but they were all responsible for her death. And I talk about your own town, Houston. In the environs of Houston, a, a, a species of mimosa tree is infested with a particular species of beetles. The female beetle becomes pregnant and must lay her eggs. She crawls out on one of the older branches of the mimosa partway to the end and cuts a deep longitudinal incision in the bark down to the living tissue of the branch. In that deep slit, she lays her eggs, and then she goes somewhere else. The eggs grow and crowd out the surrounding tissue of the branch. The branch dies and falls to the earth. Then and only then do the eggs hatch, and, a new, and new generations of beetles go off to other mimosa trees. Tree and beetle cannot get along without each other. The beetles prune the trees which are said to be healthier and to live longer than any trees in Texas. A predatory relationship thus gradually shifts to that of parties who agreed to get along. They are responsible for each other. And then I talk about this amazing process. I won't read it, but it's, it's a micro chimerism where there's cellular communication between the mother and the child when the mother, when the child is still in utero and it continues after the child's birth. And so, the child gives something to the mother, the mother gives something to the child. And I just go on and I end the section by saying we are responsible for each other, cellularly speaking. Yeah, I mean, go for it. No, I, you, you, by all means, I was just gonna just read a couple more. Oh yeah, we, I'm, I'm down for it. We live in one another's shadow, an Irish saying that like all things Irish cut several ways at once. You were asking about the influence of Ireland to me. It's in my bones now. I, uh, the, uh, um, the only thing that reveals me is not Irish is, is Rosenblatt. And uh, I could change that on a dime. We live in one another's shadow and Irish uh, saying that like all things Irish cut several ways at once. We live in one another's shadow, meaning we follow one another as in the act of shadowing or shadow is in shade, creating a canopy of protection of one person by another, or as in foreshadowing, suggesting the course of one's life that it predicts the course of another, the shadow knows, 
or as in diminished stature when one person appears unable to get out from under the shadow of, it, of another or as in accepting something flimsy or shallow, shadow rather than substance. But I see the idea of shadow as wholly responsive and giving, something projected from us, at once our image and companion that constantly and lovingly makes connections to our fellows. We live in one another's shadow, the shadow being something that extends one's being. The way a shadow cast upon the ground pre precedes us when the sun is behind us, or accompanies us along a city wall. We live in the extension and projection of one another, each person constructed to reach to reach towards somewhere else, someone else. We touch, my shadow and I, and yours. And I'll just, I don't think I should read too long. I was gonna read you on about my Aunt Julia, who was wonderful, but, um, Please do actually. I, I remember this passage from the book. Okay, you're you're very you're very sweet and tolerant. Um, uh, but then I'll after that I'll just go to the end. But I I did love my aunt. Either. My aunt Julia was small and bent from osteoporosis, and she walked with much difficulty. Though you couldn't tell because her bright hello ran interference for her. She worked at, as a, at her secretarial job her whole life, taking two weeks vacation in the summers in Kennebunkport, Maine. The proprietor of the hotel she stayed in gave Julia her room for free, simply because he liked her. Who would not like my Aunt Julia? She was life itself in a small package. An amateur painter, she, bought, she brought her canvases to Kennebunkport and her easel and oils. And she spent the long bright days painting the sea. She wore big jewelry and turbans. One summer when I was 15, out of the blue, Julia asked if I would like to join her in Kennebunk Court. Without hesitation, I said yes. Those were the summers I worked as, at a tedious job for my grandfather watching over a dead office from playing pickup basketball in nearby playgrounds. Two weeks with Julia seemed just the ticket. We took the train to Kennebunk Court, the hotel proprietor, a burly man whose face was barely visible under a cloud of gray whiskers, greeted Julia with a bear hug that hoisted her high in the air. She smiled demurely. We love to have your aunt here, the proprietor told me. This hotel has been around 162 years. Four US presidents have stayed with us, Winston Churchill too, even the Queen of Denmark. But Julia Sprook is our favorite guest. She is real aristocracy. My room had a small terrace with a direct view of the ocean. It occurred to me that it must have cost a good deal, but poor as Julia was, she never mentioned money, certainly not the lack of it. We had all our meals together. She told me about spending her days painting. I told her about my solitary walks and about meeting some kids from Boston on a beach. One girl asked me if I was an MOT, a member of our tribe, meaning Jewish. I had never heard the acronym. Julia asked what I'd said to the girl. I told her I'm not a member of any tribe, I said. Julia patted my hand. That's right, she said. I'm painting something for you, she told me. A portrait, I asked. She specialized in portraits, often of strangers, people she happened to meet. Everyone interested in her, everyone interested in her, attracting her sympathies. She loved people naturally, and she saw their worth. I'm sure I'll love it, I said. On the morning of our departure, she led me to the side porch where she had been working those two weeks. A hotel bath towel was draped over the canvas so that Julia could unveil her artistry with mock ceremony. Many years later, when she was dying, I used to hear her screams of pain in the hospital hall before I got to her room. The screams would stop abruptly when I entered and she saw me. Then she would smile and offer me the meal on her tray that she had not touched. In a faint voice, she would ask how I was doing, what I was doing. Whatever I told her, no matter how insignificant, was greeted with a joyful surprise. She never went silent. As I was leaving one afternoon, she asked if I ever looked at the portrait of me she had done in Kennebunk Port, me standing on a terrace looking out at sea and one lone sailboat. Only every, only every day, I told her. At a small memorial service in the office in which she had worked, her colleagues spoke of her warmly. Each said something different, emphasizing a particular quality of my aunt's, but 
There was no question that they were speaking of the same person. Her boss went last. He said, Julia was very small and she lived in a very small compass, but the world of her heart was immeasurable because she filled every inch with life, love and care for others. My Aunt Julia. Thank you for asking me to read that, Daniel. Yeah, thanks for reading it for us. So we come to the end of um, this book and I don't know what I've got here. I'll read you just the very end. Come do it while you can, come help them. They do not call you, they do not know you, but come help them anyway. In a shiver of wildflowers and the seepage of the December ocean, as a cortege of blackbirds passes by, do it. No need to be territorial. Extend the borders of your authority to the ferrymen, the nervous nullies, the tailors, the traders, the bird, the birders, the hoi polloi. In a snit, in a rage, in a snowstorm, the sea white as a sheet of paper, make a mad dash for them before the gate slam shut. You still have time. He who hesitates is toast. Those tanks, the machine guns mounted on the tripods, they can't hit the side of a barn. Under the, board, under the boardwalk, fish slap themselves to death. Pack up your commas and your consonants. Unfortunately, the brass band is on holiday at the Ritz. So you'll have to come unheralded, don't worry, nothing to it. No preparation necessary, you look fine. Oh, this old thing. And lose the fruit basket, come as you are. Uh, throughout the book, I play on certain themes, and one of them is September song. You know that song, Daniel? I don't. I don't know. If I do. You're you're too young for it, and it's a song, in fact, about growing old. Um, but it's sung by somebody who was in love with a younger woman, and he sings, "Oh, it's a long, long time from May to December, but the days grow long. No, sorry, they go short when you reach September." So here is, here is the last section, and I play on the song throughout. Sorry for that singing. <laughs> First light, I drift among the flotsam-like bait, circling the traps I paddle on my back, playing otter, cracking clamshells with my paws. In a passing gondola, a radio plays on the nodes of the blues. 10,000-year-old bones of murdered tribe rise up in Kenya and reassemble themselves. We are all repeat offenders. One day I'll go out and douse the flamethrowers, sink the armadas and play seven string guitar for school children. One day I'll comb the beach for bottles containing notes from the past. One day I'll die, but not today. Today I play September song on the piano. Today the wind ruffles the fretted terrain of Mars. The mimosa grows in Brooklyn. The stairway climbs to heaven where love is the selfies sleep. The, egg, the eggs hatch, the cells chat. We are life, we are love, and we are responsible for each other. I troll my paw in the water and feel candles. And these few specs, and these few precious days I'll spend with you. These precious days I'll spend with you. Man, it's such a great book. I mean, I feel compelled to share the cover again for those who are like just tuning in late. Uh, it's called Cold Moon on, li on Life. Love and Responsibility, incredible uh, work. Thank you for doing that. I have a wonderful publisher in Turtle Point Press. I had big publishers before. This was a small book and I went to a, a wonderful small press known for it, poetry. And uh, Ruth Greenstein, who is the editor and publisher of Turtle Point, accepted the book uh, much to my uh, pleasure, but they do a beautiful job with books. As you can see, this is just a nice looking book and they take care with everything. So I was blessed to have them. Yeah, I mean, it, it came out, it, when, when was it? April of 2020? Uh, October. No, October, October 2020. And I mean, it came in the midst of the pandemic, True. but also a lot of-, a lot of Yeah, uh, and I was being given credit for being, um, um, uh, having a great deal of foresight about the pandemic, which is not so, I was just talking generally. But it, then yeah. they looked back and they thought it was a book in response to it. Uh, that's nice. It's nice to have some little historical luck while, yeah. <laughs> while we were having very bad luck. In fact. Yeah. I mean, in, in many ways, I was reading through it. And I mean, like a lot of your work is so pressing. I'm thinking of the letter 2086. I got to bring that up again. It's so cool. It, if you haven't read it yet, it's such a great letter. 
I haven't read it. If you did it, I'll take your word for it. You, I, for all I know, you, you're just making this up. But I will. Um, it I'll, exists. I'll, I'll find it. My lawyers will be in touch with you if you're misrepresenting. <laughs> I assure you. Bad words. <laughs> yeah, but you know the core pillar of this of this book is that we're responsible for each other. It's, it, it, I couldn't help but think of like the Fulbright mission, which is you know this this idea of you know the mission of the Fulbright program is the mutual understanding of people in the United States and other countries. Like, what does it mean to be responsible for each other today? You think? Um, gosh, uh, the. Um, uh, it's as if the so much of the world has conspired to uh, challenge us to be responsible uh, for each other. Specifically, the administration here before uh, before Joe Biden uh, divided the country, uh, exacerbated those divisions, uh, um, made life a horror for uh, kids and for uh, their parents. Uh, every possible opportunity to hurt was taken advantage of. And um, I told you before about something, you know, I could bring it up now if you think it's appropriate, something that I did. I never have ideas. I never have you know, ideas of things that work. And I can't imagine anybody who would manage things worse than I do. But I did have this idea in November called Right America, which was to, I had seen the riots in the streets as everybody did. Um, in November, the December, and particularly in January. And I thought, uh-uh, I don't really don't want to end my life in a country that is um, uh, tearing itself apart. Mm -hmm. Not if I can help it a little. So uh, help it a little, I decided to do. And um, I wrote to fellow writers and I said, let's have a, a series, uh, a series of readings aimed particularly at healing the divisions in the country. And I wrote to a half dozen and they quickly said yes. And I wrote to 30, they said yes. Anyway, now we have 80 writers in this. We have schedules through the end of the year, um, all done with Book Review, the largest independent bookstore in Long Island. Uh, they are our angel, they, uh, they do everything for us. They are the broadcast every Monday at seven o'clock, a reading specifically with this mission in mind, same as mission as the Fulbrights. Bring people together, show the commonalities that literature allows uh, and uh, uh, be sensible rather than murderous. So uh, uh, Write America um, started, developed 80 people. Of those 80 people, half are writers of color. I, I, uh, I aim to do that. And sure enough, we have half of our number are writers of color. So even the optics as they're called now are good. But the real heart of it is what does, what does reading do? And reading says, you are me, uh, Daniel, I am you, and uh, all the people who may be watching this, the same person, same race, mm -hmm. so, uh, same desires to live um, peaceably, creatively. It's the quiet power of art. Yeah. I mean, to this end, I mean, something I really appreciate about your books, but a lot of your writing, um, and especially it's here in Cold Moon, is in the role, like, nature plays in the human psyche, you know, we're all kind of connected through nature, right? Nature is a place of simplicity, but also a place of abstraction. Could you talk a little bit about the role of nature in your writing in life? Well, 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 I'm so glad yeah. you asked that because I'm, I'm, I'm Johnny come lately to an appreciation of nature. I have friends who are born to it. Um, but lately, because I see the sim, the, what, what nature is teaching one about um, those commonalities I was talking about before. So, uh, in nature, um, in, in terms of microchimeras, I was talking about the biological, but also yeah. the astronomical. There are discoveries being, I mean, can you imagine now, as we are talking, a robot is uh, squatting and going around Mars. And <laughs> any, can you imagine this? And anytime yeah. you and I want to, we can hear the wind on Mars. We can hear the wind on Mars. You know? Yeah, that is bananas. Don't tell me the world is, not, and the galaxies are not amazing. And beyond that, Astronomers um, uh, being able to see farther than they've ever seen before have detected webs, webs uh, in the galaxies, uh, galaxies, connections of stars among the light years um, that uh, uh, paint an entirely new picture of the universe and our place in the universe. You know, there's that old thing. Um, one cannot imagine that we are alone in the universe. One can not imagine that we are not alone in the universe. And so those uh, that the tension of that conundrum is uh, tends every astronomical discoveries. Uh, they seem to come, uh, they seem to come daily. Um, 
including one, or I guess this was astronomical, about a, the uh, uh, Thea, the, uh, the planet that crashed into our planet Earth um, millions and millions of years ago. Um, and now they're detecting its position. They can see it in the middle of the Earth. It's astonishing stuff, you know. All of, all of the things that reveal how wonderfully mysterious life is. You were talking about the mystery of, of pursuing the mystery of writing before. Well, the mysteries just present themselves infinitely. Yeah. No, there's also this sort of, you know, I, I love this idea of like a shared humanity that we have. You know, one of my favorite passages um, actually comes toward the end of Cold Moon, the bit on Forrest Shackleton, whose letter uh, is thrown into the ocean was found 40 years later. <laughs> <laughs> which articulates that, yes, the world is a dangerous place. Yes, it is full of trauma, but it is also full of tenderness and interconnectedness, right? Uh, and perhaps that in a place past trauma is where humanity thrives. Um, this seems to be one of the core pillars of the book, asking the reader to hold those two ideas in their head at the same time, that it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous place, but beyond that, there's humanity. Um, or maybe it can be, could you, I mean, talk about that a little bit and to those ends and just that part of the book, which is, it's in, in, in a nutshell, it seems to sort of synthesize so much of the book. You mean, you, you mean the world as a dangerous place? Yeah, the world is a dangerous place, but a world that is ultimately interconnected. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about the dangers that the earth, <laughs> that the earth and our, our common animals are not shy to show uh, is that it uh, insists on the connections. I mean, what's the choice? You, 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 uh, you uh, either give yourself to someone, accept someone uh, wholeheartedly, or you both perish. Uh, mm -hmm. the, it's, a, it's a very simple formula. Um, of course, nobody learns it, but the, uh, 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 the idea that, um, uh, that we deserve each other, that we earn each other, that we want each other, that we are important to each other and make a, uh, a, a better place uh, of wherever we are because of each other. This is proved daily. And what's also proved daily is that if you violate those things and knock someone off, you gain nothing. Land is nothing. Land is gained and not gained. Territory gained and not gained. Uh, moment, uh, momentary triumphs followed by uh, weeping and, uh, and coffins. I saw too much of that when I went into war zones, when I was a reporter, or when I took it on myself to be a reporter. I really wasn't as good, good as most of the reporters, but I went in there to do reporting in Africa. And I mean, when I saw Rwanda, uh, I think, my God, I can see as I'm talking to you, Daniel, I can see the bridge over the Kagera River where I stood and watched a waterfall. Over the waterfall came all the bodies of the Tutsis who had been massacred by the Hutu uh, the, just a few days before. The, uh, and you think, why? Yeah. This waste, this constant, terrible, terrible waste. God knows with COVID, <clears throat> the natural world will, kill you off, will, will knock you off on its own. Why abet the situation? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to this end, I, I, I keep thinking of this moment we're in this, which, you know, we're coming out, we're on sort of the, the verge of coming out of COVID. Hopefully everyone's sort of getting back saying we reach, hopefully we reach herd immunity at some point. Um, but it seems to be that these old, you know, patterns, these old problems have sort of resurged with, with a kind of vengeance. Um, I'm thinking particularly about what's happening with uh, between Israel and Hamas. I'm thinking about... <laughs> Um, I was I was thinking of that too. It's terrible. All that loss of life for what? For what? Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Uh, but I think about this project. I want to go back to write America because I feel like it is really important. Uh, the work you're doing is really important right now. Not only the healing, sort of, or to underscoring the interconnectedness with everyone, but sort of the healing, the divides within our own nation. You know? Could you well, talk before, about I that? Take, before I take too much credit, and because she will um, crown me if I don't uh, mention her name. Lauren Limongelli, who is the publicist on that and much, much more at Book Review, the bookstore, really does most of the work. I came up with the idea. She is an amazing, an amazing woman uh, who cheerfully, and she also hosts all the shows. Uh, everybody loves her. I love her. She's, the, uh, she's, she's been a wonder. Uh, and her tone has helped a great deal, just making everybody feel comfortable. But every one of these things has been fairly successful, and they've been quite different from one another. Yeah. 
Well, I think it's a great project. And, and you said it's every Monday at seven? Every Monday at seven. We started out with Rita Dove and Billy Collins, both Poets Laureate, um, and had Francine Prose and Paul Muldoon and Paul Harding and Amy Hempel and wow. on and on and on. One really first rate writer after, uh, after another, all rising to the occasion. I think they enjoy it too. Certainly, the audience. The audiences are huge. I, I don't even know how yeah. one gets an audience like this. They <laughs> come from all over the country and at least twenty-three other countries. Yeah. Well, I think. It, I mean, the the lineups are amazing, like you mentioned. But it's such a worthy project too. Um, I think right now we're at the Q and A portion of of, uh, of of things. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat, uh, and I believe uh, they'll be coming to me. How it'll work is I'll. Go ahead and read the question and then Roger can uh, go ahead and answer it. So um, cool, it looks like we have one question. What did you do to keep yourself sane through the past year? Uh, <laughs> well, well that's, a, that's a wonderful assumption. I did nothing, I wasn't sane during the past year. The, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the beauty of this, there, is, there, are some, <laughs> there are some things to be retrieved, uh, some bright moments to be retrieved from what this horror of the last year. And for writers, we hardly notice. The, the uh, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. we are hibernated like little animals and uh, for except it's more than winter um and you know we poke our noses out to see what season it is the only difference is and this was a little eerie that we realized that the entire world was, world was hibernated with us usually it's yeah. um it's uh us on our uh us on our own um i always have writing i have my children and grandchildren and family and uh, my wife and all good things to um, uh, uh, keep uh, keep life going, and I must say, Ride America has been a wonderful sustaining event um, uh, with my fellow writers. The thing that I really loved about about this group that I've got is, um, and I didn't do any of this, by the way. I'm not taking credit for it. It's just their natures. They tune into one another. So I see in the chat line and 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 in other places uh, that Rita Dove and Jill McCorkle and Amy Hempel and um, uh, Lloyd Schwartz and whoever else is yeah. uh, uh, writing uh, uh, at the time, Paul Oster, um, the uh, um, all the all the uh, the writers are tuning into one another, and so it they, it's like a team. You know, they they're cheering one another on, but they're also interested in one another. You know, it's not it's a it's they're demonstrating by just that act alone the desire to uh, unify and uh, and keep uh, keep common uh, all the best that the mind is capable of yeah we have uh, another question which is what advice do you have for young writers i don't no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know I, I succumb to the cheapest form of humor and those kind of things um <laughs> the, the, tell me the truth uh the young writers whom we have in this uh, Stony Brook uh, Southampton program, um, which program is really good. I mean, it's, uh, and I say so because I know there was a time it was not, now it is really sailing. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in just, I'm lost in admiration of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, this is not a law school. This is not a medical school or business school. We don't give you a degree and say you are now in this profession. We don't give you anything but encouragement. On the other hand, Writing courses are the only courses in a university that are interested in you. Physics ain't interested in you. Economics ain't interested in you. But writing courses, we are interested in the person. And that is that makes for a very nice uh, teaching and learning atmosphere. And uh, so I, uh, I have, and I've been teaching during the, uh, this time and learning to teach uh, the Zoom teaching, which I kind of like. I mean, it's not as good as in person, but it's, it's certainly way ahead of nothing. Yeah, we have um, uh, we have another question, which is how do you keep hope after witnessing so much war and death? It almost works that way. You, I mean, there is, I suppose people of a different nature might become pessimistic and gloomy and depressed. I am I am not of that nature. Um, the uh, uh, I believe that um, people are are able to respond and resent, uh, and um, and behave better and uh, learn to live with one another. Children of War was an examination of kids who at the kid stage were not warlike at all. They were the peacemakers. 
They watch the adults knocking one another off and falling in the street right in front of them. And they said, not me. I don't know that that happened because the world proceeds, biology proceeds as it proceeds. But um, I, re uh, I retain uh, hope. You know, one of the great poems uh, ever written, and certainly one of the great poems in English is Thomas Gray's Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. And there is a phrase in that poem called a trembling hope, that we keep a trembling hope. And just think of both words in balance, trembling and hope, meaning uh, the world is enough to, uh, to scare the wits out of you. Um, the, everything that's happening, either a natural phenomenon or uh, the phenomenon that, pe that people bring upon themselves, such as uh, wars, et cetera, that would cause trembling. And yet we try to live in a balance between uh, hope and uh, resignation. And so uh, trembling hope is a good, a, a good formula for living. It doesn't, it, it's not unrealistic, but it, it winds up feeling better rather than worse. Yeah, now you're breaking my mind. I love that. It's a, it's a great phrase. Um, it's a wonderful <laughs> poem. You know, the, you know, the Elegy in the Country Churchyard, I think was the most popular poem in England for centuries, for a couple of centuries written in the 18th century and through the 20th because it was so smart, just so smart. Yeah, yeah. I'm not familiar with it. I gotta go check it out. You do, you, uh, it, 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 it will, I'm not kidding you, it will change your life because you will see that, you will see that life requires resignation but also courage. And between yeah. those two things, you can live a whole life. I love that, wow. I'm, I'm like processing that right now. We have a question from Beth which he says, would you talk about your writing schedule and how you prefer to write, such as hours of the day, days of the week, months, seasons? Sure. Every, everybody's is different. Mine changed considerably when we lived with our grandchildren. When our daughter died uh, 10, more than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we lived with our grandchildren and helped our son-in-law rear them. And I had, and for our writing schedule, I had to get early, up earlier than the kids. So I was getting up at four o'clock every morning and I continued to do that. I didn't always do that, but I just, I think naturally the body's clock change. I go to sleep 9, 9.30 and get up around four and work in the quiet of that time. I don't recommend it, but if you have a job, like, you know, if you really have a job and most writers do, and if you have to be at a place at nine o'clock or 10, it's not a bad idea to see if you can change your body clock so that you can buy those hours very early in the morning where it's so quiet and, and the time is uh, all yours. And then I just do it. Uh, I'm not like many of my fellows who are great writers, better than I am, um, uh, who, who, who do suffer, who do suffer writer's block and periods in which they can't write. Um, I seem always to be able to do it. I like doing it. Yeah. Uh, Emily Vargas has a, has a question, which is, what do you plan to write next? Your reflections on how to achieve peace and democracy in countries suffering from autocracy, such as Myanmar, would be very welcome. Yeah, there would be, but I'm not the guy to do it. Um, the <laughs> the uh, uh, I, it's not my kind of writing. I, I write sideways, like poems. You know, the, yeah. if I have something to say that's like it, it's like Cold Moon. And Cold Moon may be my last, actually, unless some, I get some uh, nice inspiration. But I would like to write America to continue and do and and work in behalf of foreign on uh, behalf of writing instead of uh, instead of writing. Um, but Emily, I, I have no idea, really. I mean, a, a novel could occur to me. I've, I've written two satirical novels or a serious novel. You know, you know how the writer's mind works. You will, it's, I sit at the piano every day and riff. Um, and uh, as uh, uh, Thelonious Monk said, you, you make mistakes uh, when you do that. And then you make another mistake to cover for the first mistake and you find yourself then playing the tune. And that's about the way I write. I make, uh, I'll, 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 I'll sit and I'll start to write and I'll write something else and write something else and suddenly the two of them start to uh, emerge. So it's purely a, a kind of intuitive thing that um, uh, if you have it, wonderful. And if you don't, you'll have your own intuitions, which will be just as good. Yeah. I gotta say that was one of the pleasures of reading Cold Moon was that they came in kind of bite-sized snippets. It's like, yeah, just one more. It's like a cheese it or something. You just have yeah. one more. And then you have another, and then you're done. And you're like, wow, I just read I'm that. Sure I'm glad I didn't ask you for a blurb, Daniel. Like a cheese it. Read this <laughs> book. This book is like a cheese it. It's kind of like a, I just can't stop. You know, full of carbs. It's so good. It's so good. 
No, it gives me life, gives me energy, much like harps. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a uh, <laughs> there's another question. Uh, it's a really an existential one from Boyozi. Uh, are writers born or made? A little of each, I think. I think I, I think it, you would be doing you would be lying to somebody if you said there wasn't something in writers being born. It's like musicians. That doesn't mean anybody can't do it and they get pleasure out of it. But there is a kind of everybody has a special talent, you know. Um, when, when our daughter died, uh, I wrote Making Toast and it was, um, it was good. It was good in itself and it was good for me and for my family. We, um, uh, it was worthwhile doing. Uh, but if I had been a carpenter, I might've built, built a bench. And if I had been a gardener, I might've planted something, you know? Um, it, it just happens to be the gift that I have, but everybody has a gift. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm reading, I'm just scrolling through the questions real quick. Um, uh, okay, um, one more, which is, sorry, I'm like losing myself in the chat. The chat is like on fire. Uh, last one, which of your books, whoa, <laughs> which of your books would recommend secondary school students to read? Secondary school, mm, yeah. that's good. Um, <laughs> that just a, a diversion. I, I sometimes am surprised that the essays that I wrote for time are taught in schools, and that makes me worry about education more than any other fact. Yeah. The book, I guess, that I the secondary school that I would is a, a book on writing for them. Or because the other the other books, um, and they'll get them, and there's no question. Probably my most moving book is Kayak Morning, which is about grief. But I don't want to. I don't want to make them sad. There is a, um, a book I wrote about writing where I followed a writing class. I just wrote it about a writing class over a year uh, called, uh, called Unless It Moves the Human Heart. And that book also was a Times bestseller to my great surprise and pleasure. Um, it's just a nice account of uh, a class and the kind of problems that arise in writing and our discussion of those problems. And uh, this is as much fun as it is learning. So. That one, unless it moves the human heart. Right on. Well, the, the chat is on fire. I'm sorry to say we can't get to all of the questions, but Roger, this was such a pleasure. Uh, the book is called Cold Moon on Life, Love, and Responsibility. Let me see if I got it in there. And uh, it was such a pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. You make it, you make it a pleasure, Daniel. It was, it was uh, talking about luck. It was my good luck to meet you this way. Yeah, likewise, man. I'm a huge fan. And so this was uh, real special for me. Yeah, cool. Uh, I don't know if Layla has any last uh, thoughts on. Uh, Layla, Layla are you, I, I don't want this to want us to get off without you calling me doctor again. <laughs> <laughs> I was just yeah. about to do that. <laughs> Layla, uh, because, because Layla is is lovely, extremely smart, and very respectful, insists on calling me doctor. Um, and which I, uh, if, uh, to be sure, technically I'm a doctor, but unless unless you need one of our uh, one of us PhDs in the middle of the night. I'd say I, I would say uh, Mr. <laughs> and all all yeah. the uh, uh, and all my students only call me Roger or worse. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that this was a wonderful event and it's such a pleasure to listen to you, Roger, and hear your story. So once again, I'd like to thank our speakers for being here with us today and also thank our audience mem members for joining this event and for sending all of your wonderful reactions. Thank you for that. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date on the future 75th anniversary events, please, please visit Fulbright75.org and subscribe to our newsletter. Actually, our next event will feature Fulbrighter and an artist, Sasha Valor, and you can see the link to the event in the chat. So be sure to check it out. Um, so with that, thank you, everyone. Once again, have a wonderful day, and we, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Leila. Thank you. Thank you. All right.